going to be talking about the beginning of World War II. So there's actually lots of contributing factors to the beginning of World War II. So first of all, we need to talk about the spread of dictatorships, and we're going to start with Europe. The country that we need to talk about now is Spain. General Francisco Franco, who was the general in Spain, overthrew the Republican government that was in Spain and brought fascism to Spain. So if you remember back a couple of weeks, we talked about fascism and we saw that fascism had spread to Germany and also to Italy. So now we have three countries in Europe, Germany, Italy, and Spain that are all fascist governments. So remember, fascism came to Spain. Fascism, is now in Spain as well as in Germany and in Italy. The next country we need to talk about is Japan. Although Japan is on pretty much the other side of the world from the continent of Europe, they played a huge role in World War II. So at this point in time, Japan also became a fascist government. And so they had the governor or the emperor and a specific general working together really well. So we have the Emperor of Japan and the General General Tojo for the Japanese military worked really well and basically the general did pretty much whatever the emperor wanted him to do. So we have these two men in charge of Japan bringing fascism to Japan as well. So in order to start talking about World War II, we have to look at the legacy of World War I. What had happened in world, at the end of World War I? Well, the countries that were involved in the Central Powers suffered immensely because of the, the treaty that ended World War I. They ended up losing territory, their economy ended up being in chaos, and honestly, they felt gypped. They felt like they got the short end of the stick. So, in the interval between World War I and World War II, different nations started attacking each other to kind of build their empires up again. And the first nation that we need to talk about is Japan. So the Japanese. The first group that the Japanese attacked was the area of Manchuria, which is in the northeastern part of China near Korea. So Japan attacked Manchuria. Japan attacked China, basically. The reason that the Japanese attacked in Manchuria was because their railroad had been, the Japanese railroad in Manchuria had been destroyed. Although looking back at history, uh, some historians believe that the Japanese might have actually been the ones to destroy the railroad to give themselves a reason to attack in Manchuria. So always remember, there's a lot more going on than what might meet the eye. So in a couple sections ago, we talked about how communism was trying to be implemented in China, but they had to stop because they were attacked. The reason they, the Chinese had to stop implementing communism in their country is because Japan attacked them. And this is what we're talking about now. So once the Japanese gained control of Manchuria, they went after mainland China and they continued to attack the Chinese. Um, the League of Nations, which was supposed to be the organization that kept peace in the world after World War I, basically protested the Japanese attacking China, but they didn't do anything concrete. So Japan said, all right, fine, we're out of this League of Nations, and they left. Uh, the Japanese attacked the Capital, the capital of the Republic of China during this time period, and for six weeks, Japanese soldiers went on a rampage, murdering hundreds of thousands of Chinese civil, civilians and unarmed Chinese soldiers. Thousands of Chinese women were brutally assaulted. The exact number of people who were harmed during this Nanking massacre is unknown. 
because the Japanese authorities destroyed the evidence of these crimes at the end of the war. Um, it looks like at least 200,000 people were killed, but the Chinese ex estimate that it was closer to 300,000. The Japanese were extremely brutal throughout the entire World War II era, and that ended up leading long, having long-term repercussions and having the Japanese be very have very difficult relationships with the other Asian countries like um, Korea and China. So that's what was happening with Japan. Japan wasn't the only country that was trying to expand its empire. Italy was also trying to expand its empire and they attacked Ethiopia, which is the country directly to the south of Egypt in Africa. So Italy was trying to expand into Africa. And again, we see that the League of Nations did nothing. They didn't try to stop the Italians. They didn't um, sanction them or tell them what they were doing was wrong. They did nothing. So this, this organization, the League of Nations, that was supposed to keep peace in the world, wasn't doing that. Next, we come to Germany. Hitler's goal for Germany was to get rid of defective and undesirable citizens. And for Hitler, this meant anyone who was Jewish, obviously, everyone knows about the Holocaust, but those weren't the only kinds of people that Hitler was trying to rid Germany of. He was also trying to rid them of people who were mentally ill, people who had um, other strange characteristics that or people who had Down syndrome. These were the kinds of people that Hitler thought were defective and undesirable. Let's just pause for a moment here and I want you to think about this. Does God think that anyone is undesirable? No, God created everyone. We are all created in God's own image and so there is no one that God views as being defective and undesirable. So this goal of Hitler to get rid of defective and undesirable citizens was absolutely against what God would view and, and the Bible. In Germany, Hitler established something called the Third Reich. This was the name for his government. So you need to know that Germany under Hitler established the Third Reich. So this was Hitler's empire. Everyone should have known what Hitler was planning to do because he had written in his autobiography, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, what he planned to do. Mein Kampf was translated into English and Americans bought the book, English people bought the book, and many films of Hitler's speeches were broadcast and translated to many other countries, including the United States. So everyone should have known what Hitler was doing. He didn't keep it a secret. He made it very clear that he wanted to take over the world, but everyone just kind of ignored it and thought he was joking. So the first place that Germany expanded to was the Rhineland. I'll have a map for you in just a moment. But the Rhineland is a tiny area on the border between Germany and Belgium. Hang on one second. Didn't Germany and Belgium make a treaty saying that their borders were going to be permanent? They did. So if that was true, then Germany should not have been able to attack Belgium and take over this area called the Rhineland. Europe? pretty much did nothing. France was mad, but that's about it. Everyone else didn't do anything. Then Germany and Austria started to work together, but because of the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, they couldn't make an official alliance. So Hitler had the Austrian Nazis take control of the country and then say, Oh, Hitler, we need help. Can you please come help us in Austria to rule our country? And so that's when Hitler came in and took over Austria without firing a shot, pretty much. 
if you've watched The Sound of Music, this is what happens in the movie The Sound of Music when the father of the seven children is told that he needs to go to join the Nazi Germany army and he refuses and that's why the Von Trapp family ended up leaving the country of Austria and they ultimately fled to the United States. So now Germany has control of the Rhineland, they have control of Austria, but of course Hitler's not quite done yet. So he ends up taking, demanding that part of Czechoslovakia become part of Germany. And this is the Studentenland. So he ended up demanding that Czechoslovakia give over a part of its, its land. And Germany and, or sorry, England and France called the Munich Conference and they basically let Adolf Hitler take over the Sudetenland. They didn't do, again, they didn't do anything to stop him. So Hitler learned from the Munich Conference, Europe's not going to stop me from doing what I want to do. So with the Munich conference, Hitler learned that Europe wasn't going to stop him. You can see I put up a map for you. Uh, you have Germany labeled, you have the Rhineland labeled on the left side of Germany, the light color right around Czechoslovakia between Czechoslovakia and Germany is the Studentenland, and then you also have Austria. So at this point in time, Germany controls all of that land. So during this time, the democratic European nations, such as France and England, did not do anything to try and stop Hitler. They failed to oppose Hitler. This is super important, and this is why Hitler thought he could get away with whatever he wanted to. The European nations that were dem democratic, England, France, failed to stop Hitler's aggression. Part of the reason was because the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain, had this idea of appeasement. So during this time period, Neville Chamberlain was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister of Great Britain right before World War II. You also need to make sure that you understand what appeasement means. Basically, appeasement is avoiding conflict by making concessions. So we're just going to let Adolf Hitler do whatever he wants because hopefully, eventually, he'll just stop. It didn't happen. But appeasement, avoiding conflict by making concessions. Appeasement avoiding conflict by making concessions. America during this time was doing an isolationist type of policy. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. It's the 1930s. Our economy is a mess. Our country is trying to just barely survive. And so because of that, America was isolated and they didn't get involved with the conflict that was happening in Europe. So keep that in mind. America is isolated. Europe is trying to appease Hitler, and they're basically letting him do whatever he wants to do. So eventually, Europe finally woke up and realized, wait, appeasement's not working, so we need to do something. And that is when a whole bunch of different treaties started to be made. We're going to see the Axis powers formed, and we're going to see um, the Allied powers start to form. So the first alliance that was made was between Italy and Germany. And we have the Rome-Berlin Axis. Rome is the capital of Italy. Berlin is the capital of Germany. So that's why it's called the Rome-Berlin Axis between Italy and Germany. The next pact was the anti turn Pact, and that was created between Germany and Japan. The important thing that you need to know here is that the anti turn Pact 
Comintern was a shortened version of the communist um, communist international and so that's why it's called Comintern. So anti Comintern pact between Germany and Japan was against Russia or what it was called then the Soviet Union. So one more pact needed to be made in order to create the three main Axis powers, and that was between Italy and Japan, and that pact was made. So now we have Italy and Germany allied with each other, Germany and Japan allied with each other, and Italy and Japan aligned with each other, and those three countries together, Italy, Germany, and Japan, created the Axis powers for World War II. Now, during this whole time period, while these countries, all fascist countries, were making alliances with each other, Europe was getting lulled into peace and security because they were more afraid of communism than they were afraid of fascism. Um, so then we come to May 1939 and we have the Pact of Steel which was made between Italy and Germany. So we have another pact between Italy and Germany being made. And the, so Pact of Steel, Italy and Germany. Then in August of 1939, getting very close to the beginning of World War I, or World War II, uh, Germany and the Soviet Union made an alliance with each other and they agreed to not attack each other for the next 10 years. And Japan and the Soviet Union, also Russia, um, made a similar agreement. Remember, Russia is huge and it spans both, it has, it's in Europe and it's also all the way to Asia. So if Russia had attacked Germany and Japan at the same time, then they would be attacking both of these Axis powers. So that's why the the Japanese and the Germans felt like they needed to make a treaty with Russia to try and keep Russia out of the war. Ultimately, Russia is going to join the war on the Allied side, but we'll see that later on. All right, continuing on with events that triggered the war, we come to September 1st, 1939, and on that day, Germany invaded Poland. Remember, Europe has been appeasing, appeasing, appeasing up until this point, and so Hitler expected that France and Great Britain were just going to continue to appease. But that's not what happened. When Germany invaded Poland, Poland, Britain, and France all declared war against Germany. So the German invasion of Poland led to Poland, Britain and France declaring war. So who started World War II? Germany. Germany started World War II with the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, Germany started the war, World War II. Now, the Japanese were also doing things. During this time, they were trying to negotiate with the United States but like behind closed doors, the Germans or the Japanese were also preparing for war. On December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And when Pearl Harbor was bombed, that was the event that brought the United States into the war. But remember, World War II started in 1939. The United States didn't join until two years later, 1941. Important thing to note here is that although Pearl Harbor was bombed and lots of ships were destroyed, lots of soldiers were killed, and lots of aircraft were destroyed, the U.S. aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor. And because of this, the United States was able to jumpstart their preparation a lot more quickly than if all of their ships that were in Pearl Harbor had been destroyed. The really cool thing about World War II is that this is a time period where video footage was available. People were able to see pretty much very quickly after the events happened what was going on. 
So the next video that you're going to watch as part of your lecture videos for this week is a newsreel of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So this is what people would have gone to the movie theaters to see. Before you saw a movie back in the 1940s, you would see a short newsreel, and that's how that was one way that people got their news. So next video you'll watch in this section is going to be a actual video footage that people would have seen back in the day of the bombing of Pearl Harbor.